Greetings, church family. We trust all is well with you and yours this Wednesday afternoon. I uh, pray that everything is well with you and your family. Pray that God would protect us and keep us stay safe from these potential outbreak storms, uh, supposed to be damaging winds, potential tornado, hail damage is Matt Lipon's greatest fear of uh, these storms being produced. So I uh, pray we would be preserved through all that, that God would be with us and see us through. Uh, do pray for one another in these days. Pray for uh, each member of Cornerstone Baptist Church. Pray for our missionaries, especially those that are shut in, uh, those that are battling sickness, those that have lost loved ones. Just ask the Lord to help them. And uh, pray for a good day this Lord's Day. So pray you'll be there, Sunday School 10, morning worship 11. And we will be observing the Lord's Supper in the morning service at the, near the close of the service. And so trust and pray you'll be there. You'll be prepared to participate in that. Alrighty, so uh, if you have your Bibles, be turning to Romans chapter 12, please. Romans chapter 12, verse number 9, and we'll read through the remaining of the chapter. Don't know how far we'll get, but we will read uh, the remaining of the chapter. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor <clears throat> that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, rejoicing, uh, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place uh, unto wrath. For his written vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil uh, with good. And certainly we are uh, mindful of this passage. We are um, very much um, considering... Uh, th this passage, man, it's very eye-opening. He has spent time speaking of exercising our gifts, our spiritual gifts. And um, now he, he moves from exercising our spiritual gifts to showing grace uh, to others. And certainly we are very thankful for the opportunity to exercise those spiritual gifts. And we are also thankful for um, the blessing of being able to show grace to others. And with this being hinged on let us present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. He's now dealing with how we are to live our Christian life knowing that God has given us grace and has gifted us, and now we are to use those gifts and live our lives based upon the grace and the gifts that we have received from Christ. So um, there, there is no passage quite like these verses that I read to you in our New Testament. There are roughly 20 commands here in the passage that we've uh, read to our hearing. And what you keep finding is this theme of the love of God, love. Love is found numerous occasions through uh, these verses. Romans 12, to be matter of fact, focuses on love. It fits Paul's theology nicely in what he has been dealing with up to this point. 
His longest virtue list uh, that centers on love is not is 1 Corinthians 13. And this passage is closely related to 1 Corinthians uh, 13. And so God's love drives um, his redemption. And, and so thus the love of God is both the context and the motive for the love he requires in us as believers, and that love is demonstrated and displayed through chapters 12, 13, and 14 of the book of Romans. Especially in chapters 5 and 8, for instance, Romans 5, 5 says the love of God's been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. All right, Romans 5, 8, three verses later, the Bible tells us, but God commended or demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then we get to chapter number eight and it says, uh, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, nakedness, famine, peril, sword, etc." He says, in these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And so it's love that brought us in. It's love that keeps us in. It's love that's going to see us through. And if there's ever a time God's people need to be displaying and demonstrating and declaring this love of God, it's now more than ever is it needed. And not only to be said and to be taught, but actually to be evidence by our changed lives and our community of local believers coming together, loving God and loving one another. And it's radically revolutionizing our lives when we do this. And so Jesus said, there's two things that fulfills all the law and prophets. Love God with everything you have, all your heart, mind, body, soul, strength. And the second, it's like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. And so let's let's just look at this verse, uh, uh, verse nine and ten. To be be honest with you, uh, I, I want to emphasize this about love, and and if there's got to be one thing that's uh, got to be paramount, and it is the love of God. Jesus said in John thirteen thirty five. By this, all men will know you're my disciples if you have love one toward another. Okay. And, and, and even in the epistles of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, numerous times it says if we do not love the brethren, the love of the Father is not in us and we are not his. And so we need to understand love. Now the world has manipulated what love is. Okay, that there are many definitions of love, but there's there's four Greek words for love. If I am mindful of not uh, mindful of this. Uh, but maybe we'll get there, maybe we won't, but that will be something we will look at. So look at verse 9. It says, let love be without dissimulation. Okay? Let love be without dissimulation. Um, th this word dissimulation is uh, it's a very important word. And uh, we have to know what it means. We don't use the word dissimulation. But what it means is let love be without dissimulation, which this word dissimulation, if you look it up, Strong's will point you uh, in the right direction. Also a good Bible dictionary will help us understand it. So when it says let love be without dissimulation, it simply means let love be without hypocrisy. So in the context of what he's saying here is you need to let love be genuine, okay? 
And so when he says, let it be without dissimulation or hypocrisy, what he is is that love is not an act like a play actor on a theater stage. It's not us playing the part. It's not us appearing like we love when we really do not love. In John's epistle, he would say, uh, brethren, you love not only in word, but you love in deed and in truth. Don't, don't love in word honor, uh, in word only, but in deed and in truth. It's the same thing Jesus would say, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is, from, is far from me. And so what this command is telling us is that you, you and I need to let our love for God and each other be real. Let it not be this fake pretend, oh, I, I butter you up to your face and behind your back, I'm dogging you out. And, and so these things aren't not be, beloved. Um, let's not pretend to hug. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we, we, we would hug somebody and call them friends, say, well, I love you. But if we don't mean it, it's better not for us to say it because then that's what the, we're violating this command. And so this is full-blown hypocrisy at best. I mean, look at Judas. He pretended to love Jesus, then portrayed him with a kiss. That said, indifference is more common than hate. Indifference says, how are you doing? And then hurry off when an honest answer emerges. The goal is sound compassionate, but not to be compassionate. Some do act. Um, but they hope for recognition to pay a debt or to make someone their debtor. And, you know, that's, that's not love. And so if there ever was a sense that there needs to be uh, love without dissimulation or hypocrisy, it should be, it should be even in our homes. It should be when we are at home amongst our, our, our wives and our children and uh, there she is right there well all right anyway she just trying to shred that uh, but anyhow you know <laughs> loving love doesn't change you know what they do or what they try to destroy uh, but you know our love ought to be without hypocrisy and and the sure sign of that is that we, we're commanded to Husbands, love your wives as even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. As we think about the family unit, there, there, there's no love greater than the love you have for your own family. But later on in this passage, he's going to tell us, you know, it's easy for us to love those who love us back. But as believers, we're commanded to even love our enemies at the latter part of this chapter is going to tell us, yes, that's hard to do. But even Christ loved the very ones that crucified him. And even on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And, and that's this supernatural. This is that agape, this unconditional. This is that God love that we see in John three sixteen. And multiple times throughout all of our Bible. So let love be without dissimulation. But what goes along with don't let it be with hypocrisy. Let it be real. Let it be genuine. And uh, we look on Father and he says, I want you to abhor that which is evil. I want you to hate. That's what a poor means. I want you to hate that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. So in other words, love is perceptive. Love is to be uh, discerning and not just sentimental or emotional. Uh, believers should loathe evil. As 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us that we are to prove 
what is good. You prove what is good. So in other words, you put it to the test with Scripture. And if Scriptures declare it's good, then we are to cleave to that. But if it's not, we are to abhor. Now, Proverbs chapter number 6, verses 16 through 19, tells us there are six things the Lord hates. A proud look, a, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, um, uh, you know, feet that run to evil, uh, a false witness that breathes out lies, one that sows discord among the brethren, one that uh, goes and have, makes these evil plans. And so there, there are some things God says he hates, you know, and, and, and God is, is, he loathes this evil. Uh, in, in our society today, friend, and, and, and the things that's mentioned in Proverbs 6, it, it's even seen, it's even seen within the church and in the Christian, so-called Christian's life. I mean, one in particular is one who sows discord among the brethren. So if you're causing divisions, you're causing strife, you're, you're sitting there trying to get a following after you, uh, and, and you're dividing the body of Christ, God says he hates that, and he's going to get you uh, for doing that. And so we need to be mindful of these things. Genuine love, uh, it, it, it abhors what is evil, and it cleaves to that which is good. Now, I, I do want to look at verse 10 and try to deal with this. Real quickly, it says, Be ye kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. This is Philadelphia, phileo. This is the Greek word, brotherly love. All right, you have gape, that's unconditional. You have phileo, that's brotherly love. There is this, this, this Greek word for love that's called storg, storg uh, which is talking about husband-wife love. And th there's one more that slips my mind at the moment. I don't have it in my notes uh, tonight, but those are three of the four Greek words for love. And so here is Phileo, which is Philadelphia, the, the city known for brotherly love. And so here you have, we need to be showing brotherly love toward uh, each other. Um, so that, that, that's very important. It describes a, a family affection. Uh, this, this love goes to uh, the delightful and the admirable within our ranks. Uh, it goes to each member of the body of Christ that we are to love each other as our own brother or sister, as our own family uh, in the body of Christ. And so, and he says, in honor, preferring one another. And he gives us his semicolon. And, and we need to honor each other and... And not only honor each other, um, but preferring one another, it says. Um, it, it means that we seek the well-being of others before ourselves. So to be Christ is to be selfless. I would do without. I would take the back seat in preferring my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and, and, and when we have this mentality, when we have this mentality, church, when, when we seek to honor others, we stop thinking doesn't anybody appreciate me? We don't have to ask that question because in honor, we're preferring others, okay? So we're not worried about our self-image. We're not worried about our self, quote-unquote, worth. We're not worrying about our own well-being. We're more worried about the everybody else. I want to make sure everybody's taken care of. And, and I'll be all right if it doesn't come my way. And then, then we get to the point when we start preferring one another, we don't have to ask, well, nobody down there appreciates me. 
And, uh, but it, and if that's a common question you deal with, you, you're, you, you have pride and you have envy and you need to repent. I need to repent. When we think we, we, we have a pity party, we need to cut down the tree. We need to repent and get right with God and start honoring and preferring one another and loving each other with a brotherly love. Because what you're saying is, I'm doing all the right things. Nobody's appreciating. It's getting, you know, nobody cares anymore. They're not appreciating. So we need to drop the envy and, and this ambition that, that requires recognition. It, you know, when we in honor prefer one another, we don't worry about whether I get recognized or not. You know, I don't have to ha have it broadcasted everything that I do because in the end, God sees it all. God knows it all. And, and he's in charge uh, over the rewarding department. And I don't need the recognition of man or the applause of man. And so should everybody in the body of Christ that we honor each other and we prefer each other. And so we, we value each other more than we value ourselves. And so this is a wonderful two verses that I wanted to cover with you tonight. Um, and, and we'll probably say more about this, these two verses as we uh, continue our look through uh, the book of Romans, uh, but uh, I sure do love you, church. I appreciate you. I hope these two verses have been uh, a little help to you, but may God help us in these days. I know how real it is for you and me to struggle with discouragement and, and to wonder if anybody cares. Uh, you know, and, and we get the sense of, well, if Am I even really appreciated? Those are real things. They're real concerns. But it's in those moments that we are more worried about us than everybody else. So if you're serving God for the right reasons, you're at Cornerstone for the right reasons because you love God and you love each other. It doesn't matter if you get recognized or not, in a sense, you know. So that's easy for you, Pastor. You're up on the 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 platform all the time. You, you're under the spotlight. And none of that matters to me. I don't have to be in the spotlight. I I, I am because that's where I, I, my place of service is in the pulpit. Uh, my place of service is to administer the word of God, to pray for you, to love on you, to, to declare to you the truth of the gospel in hopes that you have repented and believed the gospel and that you still are repenting and believing the gospel. So it never stops. It's a never-ending cycle. And we deal with these hard issues uh, from the Bible and this biblical truth from the Bible because we love you and we want you to know the truth. The truth is the only thing that can set us free. And, and I'm willing to set aside myself just to tell you the truth, whatever the cost. And, and every one of us are to be willing to care for one another, to show sympathy toward one another, and um, prefer one another. And, and in doing that, we'll be a church that honors and glorifies God. God will get honored. God will get the glory. And God will give the increase. And I tell you, if, if and when, we all get to where Paul is trying to get the body of believers here in Romans 12, where we already done presented our body a living sacrifice. When we've done, done that, and, and now we're, we're exercising our gifts, and now we're exercising grace, and we're displaying and demonstrating the very love of God, a world that's hurting is going to take notice. And the talk's going to get out. And there's one thing I know about this old world. They're interested in this selfless, sacrificial love of God they've heard about. They've, they've heard about it, okay? They've been taught about it. But there's a, that's not enough. They're still looking for it to be 
demonstrated or displayed. And the local New Testament church is the place where the love of God ought to be paramount. And it ought to be real. It ought to be evident. And when they see a group of people loving God and loving each other, and it's love in action, people are going to get curious. How is it they have that? And there's only one explanation. It's because God has shed it abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. This happened at the new birth. And what's missing in a lot of places, in a lot of people's life, is that they know the language. They know the routine. They know, the, they know religion. They don't know Christ. They don't have the life. They don't have the light. They don't have the love. And it's evident by their living. May God help us. May God help us be vessels that are filled with the love of God and with brotherly love. And may it be displayed by us caring for one another, honoring one another, preferring one another, serving one another for the glory of God. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday, Lord willing. 10 o'clock Sunday school, morning worship 11. See you then, church.